Hello gorgeous, welcome to my channel. Uh, <laughs> welcome to History of the Beauty Community, Tease, Drama, Scandals and Controversies Part 4, which is everything that I missed. I cannot even begin to explain to you how much, just like, I think it's pain. I think I'm in pain. <laughs> If this is the first video of mine you're catching, I'm so sorry. Uh, check out one, two, and three before this. Um, it'll definitely paint you a picture as to how I got myself to this point. Don't show empathy for me. I did this to myself. I didn't even do my proper intro. Hello gorgeous, welcome back to Watercolor Convo Makeup, where I talk about the things that you want me to talk about, where I talk about the things that I want me to talk about. Sometimes we meet in the middle and I talk about the things that we want me to talk about while I do my makeup, and apparently today, while I lose my fucking mind. Oh, I finished the notes last night and I was like, woo, it's done. And then I was like, oh, now I gotta film it and 14,000 words. I know that this is gonna be at least 15 hours worth of footage. Um, on three hours worth of sleep, this is gonna be good. <laughs> Disclaimer and content warning, in this video, as I have already specified, I will be discussing the history of the tease, drama, scandals and controversies of the beauty community, which means that I will have discussions of racism and transphobia. If you find any of these topics potentially triggering, please proceed with caution or consider clicking off of the video altogether because at the end of the day, I do not want for my content to jeopardize your happiness and jeopardize your well-being. And even though I say this in every single one of my videos, I still need to explicitly state that I do not promote, encourage or endorse any kind of mean, malicious, negative, harassing behavior. My videos are strictly for entertainment purposes only so I do not want for any kind of mean, hateful, harassing, malicious behavior to go out there into the world because of something that I've said or on my behalf, especially because some of these stories have happened like over a decade ago. Oh, that kind of hurts. We are of course allowed to keep it cheeky, we're allowed to keep it messy, we're allowed to keep it fun as always, but please keep it to this comment section and this channel only. With all of that said, just brace yourselves. Uh, <laughs> let's get into it. I don't know if I've made this public knowledge before, but I have such a limited sense of smell that I essentially say that I don't have a sense of smell because it's very rare that I can actually smell something. Um, but I heard that incense is really good for just calming. So, um, this one's called Zen. Um, it's got pure essential oils, mandarin grapefruit, patchouli, ylang ylang, and cedarwood. Ooh. First cap off the rank. Did my light just go out? <laughs> I charged these lights last night. Oh. <laughs> this incense. Not zen. <laughs> First up we have Blair Fowler and Elle Fowler, two YouTube OGs that got themselves in a bit of hot water because people realised that they were using stage names. Their online names were fake, probably for safety, which I think is pretty fair, but at the same time there was also some speculation that both of them were being paid for promotion when it came to certain products and they weren't disclosing those business relationships. I can't find any evidence to suggest that this is the case and don't get me wrong, this still sucks and I do think that everyone should be disclosing information to their subscribers when it comes to paid promotion, but at the same time, this was around 2008, 2009, 2010 when YouTube was still like a concept really. <laughs> Even though I still think this is shitty behavior for how young and misunderstood paid promotion was on YouTube back in 2008, 2009, 2010. I get it. I don't agree with it, but I get it. And that is all the information I could find. So I'm pretty sure that I've missed something because in the grand scheme of things, a stage name and not disclosing information about a paid promotion back in 2008, 2009, 2010 seems, for lack of a better phrasing, small. I think that over the last more than a decade, so much shit has just happened in the beauty community that all of these, as I said before, for lack of a better phrasing, small, Tease drama scandals and controversies seem to degrade over time with their information, but also degrade over time with their severity. This one was actually brought to my attention by one of you in one of your comments specifying that there was a scam that Tess Holiday was involved in, and I was like, what? Yeah, what? Okay. For those who don't know, Tess Holiday is a plus size model that became quite famous around 2013, 2014, 2015, thanks to her confidence, thanks to her being the first 
plus size model size 22 in the UK, but also for her hashtag F your beauty standards, but also just a lot of other things. And because of all of this, Tess Holiday decided that she was going to release a merchandise line called F your beauty standards. And in that she was going to release t-shirts for $40 US t-shirts look really cute really 2014 and a part of the proceeds actually were going to be donated to the national coalition against domestic violence pre-order officially launched in 2014 but this very exciting moment quickly turned sour with a lot of fans and a lot of supporters feeling quite scammed because the things that they bought their t-shirts just weren't showing up and also there was no evidence to suggest that any of the proceeds were actually donated to charity. There was a full year like all of 2015 and some of 2016 where people were asking for their shirts, where people were asking for what they paid for, where people were asking for a refund, where people were asking where the money was going, what it, like how much of the money was actually going to charity because it only ever said proceeds. I've said this in one of my previous videos, if you are going to do something for charity, make sure you specify what charity and also how much is going to charity. It doesn't matter if it's $2 a shirt or if it's 5% of the profits, just specify how much so that people know what to expect. People's merchandise wasn't showing up. People were getting incredibly frustrated to the point where a Facebook group was actually made called F Your Customer Service. <sighs> Tess eventually had an interview with Refinery, which was... <laughs> The interview was definitely a choice. Uh, it was a very interestingly worded poor me story with Tess specifying that she had only the best intentions and she didn't really understand all of the responsibilities that she was signing up for, which... Uh, like soz babes. <laughs> you... You chose this. No one was forcing you to start a t-shirt line or a merchandise line. You... You chose this. If something goes wrong, unfortunately, you signed up for it to be your responsibility to fix it. And if you don't know how to fix it, guess what? It's your responsibility to do. Employ someone to help you fix it. And even if you don't know how to fix it, and even if you are waiting on someone to be employed to fix it, the least you can do is answer emails, is to answer customer service questions so that you don't have like hundreds to thousands of people wondering where the thing that they have bought is. It just, uh, the longer you leave people in the dark, the longer you don't answer people's questions, the longer you leave people on red, the more trash you look. Either way, according to Tessa's interview, she had issues with the manufacturer and also with the software that she was using for the website. Apparently people's orders were coming up as not paid, even if they were paid, which once again, employ someone, but whatever, it's just, it's just a thing. Customers were eventually able to fill out a missing order form and by the looks of it, some people were able to have their merchandise finally sent out to them. And I think by the looks of it, some people actually got a refund. But unfortunately, the people who received the t-shirts that they spent 40 US dollars on, they were pretty bad quality. They, uh, the, the front of it was just, if I'm paying 40 bucks, oh, I would be a bit of Betty after that one. And just to rub even more salt into the already salty wound, allegedly only a thousand dollars was actually donated to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So with the shirts priced that high, people were people were like, what? Only a thousand? Like a thousand's still a lot of money, but it just, that's... Something's not adding up, is it? Uh, and at the same time, just to add even more salt in the wound, while people were waiting on their shirts, Tess was taking quite a few trips for herself, which included a few trips to Disneyland. So people were waiting for their shirts, money wasn't getting donated to charity, and they were watching the person who was working really hard to run this merch line off on a holiday while people were still wa waiting for their shirts. It would, it would, yeah. I made another coffee. <laughs> Don't judge me, please. All right, it's the last video. Until the end of the year when we recap 2021. <laughs> um, I'm kind of excited for that one though. Uh, I feel as though that one's gonna be less strenuous and less hard to find all the information for because it was this year. Either way, let's jump to 
2015. <laughs> Specifically February where Jackie Ina posted a life hack video and the first life hack she shared with us, the first piece of wisdom she shared with us was the fact that she used breast milk to heal up her eye infection. Look, you do you, but I will not be participating in this life hack. But some of Jackie's fans were quite angry with her for suggesting that people should use breast milk to fix an eye infection because it's a bodily fluid and therefore it could harbor diseases and like give you something worse than an eye infection. People were accusing Jackie of being quite reckless and dangerous with this life hack and Jackie clapped back and said that she never suggested that anyone should be using a stranger's breast milk and she specified that the breast milk she was using was a very close friend of hers and she took all of the proper precautions to make sure that it was safe. The video still exists, the comments are just turned off of the video and by the looks of it Jackie's career has very much survived this odd little moment in history. Then we jump essentially a whole other year to May of 2016. This story is an absolute maze so I'm going to try my hardest to map it out as cohesively and as clearly as possible for everyone but this story involves Jeffree Star, Makeup by Shayla, Ma and Amrezy. Back in 2016 Jeffree Star went on one of his famous Snapchat rants. Yes iconic and called out makeup by Shayla for bullying another makeup creator. According to Jeffree Star Snapchat rant, another unspecified at this point in time, another unspecified makeup creator was questioning whether she should get lip fillers or not and Shayla apparently turned around and said, you need lip fillers, your face is disproportionate, which that's it's a bit spicy. <laughs> he essentially said how disgusting this was that a person would critique another person's looks and just you're, you're gross, you're trash, you're irrelevant, blah blah blah. But then took a moment to say that Makeup by Shayla could have fun existing with her fucked up cheek filler. Like, is this just me? Like, did this not start from lip filler? Like, lip filler, oh, no, no, no. Cheek filler, oh, it's just fine. <laughs> Oh, please, someone find me the logic. Whatever. Either way, there was some nasty back and forth between Makeup by Shayla and Jeffree Star, both on Snapchat and on Twitter. And on Twitter, Jeffree Star even specified that he would beat Makeup by Shayla to the ground. Uh, it's just... If someone is threatening violence in an argument, it is because their argument lacks substance. That is my personal opinion. I, like, for what other reason in a situation like this does someone need to say, I'm gonna beat your ass? It's unnecessary. Why are you doing it? It's a scare tactic. And then sometime throughout the Twitter feud, Jeffree Star decided that he was going to out the allegedly bullied party in the situation and specify that it was another beauty creator called Ma. Makeup by Shayla then tweeted to Ma specifying that she'd only met her once, but from their brief interaction, she thought that Ma was gorgeous. Uh, Ma sent back a tweet saying, thanks. Uh <laughs> Cool. And then Jeffree Star decided to finish the conversation by posting a screenshot of a private conversation that him and Ma just had. So it was kind of like the final nail in the coffin. That was the, the like full stop on the conversation. Like, oof, there's the DM. I win. <laughs> And this is where the situation starts to split off because we have Amrezy versus Shayla, which uh, uh, I haven't heard of either party before, really sorry, so I don't really know what kind of baseline these people are, um, but here we go. At this point in time, from my understanding, Makeup by Shayla and Amrezy were friends, which great, love that for them, but because of this and because of the Twitter feud with Jeffree Star, Amrezy or Amra was getting called out for not defending her friend, for not defending Makeup by Shayla. Then in 2017, Makeup by Shayla posted this tweet specifying that she left all of her fake friends back in 2016, and Amra responded to it saying that she had time to call people fake and to subtweet, but didn't have any time to answer the phone to a friend. And then Amra went on on a very lengthy, very aggressive Snapchat rant. It was, I watched the rant and that was, I, I can't tell if she was so exasperated by the situation and by her friendship with Shayla that there was nothing else to do but just to shout at her phone, which wouldn't be what I would do, but also I can understand how someone else would, 
or if it was her shouting to try and convince people. I don't know who Amra is. I I don't know what kind of a baseline kind of person she is, but I I can see both sides. It's a choice, wouldn't be my choice, but I get it. By the way, during the makeup by Shayla Jeffree Star Twitter feud, she expected her friend to have her back during the situation. And Amra allegedly essentially turned around and said that it wasn't her problem and was also enjoying the consequences that makeup by Shayla was facing. And then allegedly some days later after this Twitter feud, Amra actually promoted Jeffree Star Cosmetics on her socials. So... In this situation, I'm not surprised that Makeup by Shayla didn't want to pick up the phone. Because I wouldn't, but at the same time, I don't know the ins and outs of their friendship, so I may also not be surprised to hear that Amra didn't want to defend her friend. And if you thought that that was messy, <laughs> in July of 2020, Ma posted a video to her YouTube channel called I Was Friends With Jeffree Star, Our Drama. In this video, Ma discussed her perspective being the bullied party in the lip filler situation and the Twitter feud that happened because of the lip filler situation. So her perspective is quite important considering that she was the bullied party. She was essentially the catalyst of the situation. And from her perspective, she met Makeup by Shayla and Jeffree Star on the same night for the first time at an Urban Decay party. And at that party, they were all at the same table uh, or they were all in the same circle and they were all discussing different cosmetic surgeries, different cosmetic enhancements that everyone had gotten. Jeffree Star was allegedly talking about his veneers. Great, love that for him. And at one point, because lip fillers were a really big thing back then, Ma asked people if they thought that she would look good with some lip fillers. And apparently, according to Ma, the bullied party, Makeup by Shayla just turned around and said like, oh, I think you'd look good with lip fillers, specifically on the top lip. And I watched Ma's video and I watched how she was discussing everything. And by the sounds of Ma's recollection, Makeup by Shayla was just answering Ma's question and she was just giving her personal opinion to the question that Ma answered. But at the same time, everyone kind of agreed and moved on from the conversation. It was just like a, should I get lip fillers? Sure, I think it'd look nice. That was it. Ma even specified in her video that she left the party feeling no ill feelings towards the party or the people at the party and even specified that she really enjoyed herself. And she was really happy with the opportunity that she was given. And then next minute she has Jeffree Star tagging her on Twitter and she's like, oh, Jeffree Star tagged me on Twitter. Oh, what, it, what is this? And next minute she's a bullied party in a situation that she didn't realize was a situation. Ma even specified in her video that from her perspective, even Jeffrey left that conversation with no hard feelings. So she was really confused by the situation. And then next thing she knows, Jeffree Star is DMing her and she didn't really know what to write back, but she wrote back something that she thought wouldn't cause any more drama. And then next thing she knows, Jeffree has taken a screenshot and posted that to Twitter without her consent as ammunition to just finish off Shayla and finish the conversation and I won. Once again, we have a situation where Jeffree Star not only stirred the pot, he also set the kitchen on fire just because he could. And at the same time, weaponized an innocent conversation and weaponized someone else's personal experiences where no one was left with hurt feelings just for shits and gigs. Because if he was really concerned about Ma's feelings, would he not have contacted Ma to see if she was all right? A situation that I have talked about in a previous video, just not a History of the Beauty Community video. I instead talked about it in my Jaclyn Hill Butterfly Effect video, and that is the Becca eyeshadow palette released in June of 2016. June 16th, 2016, Jaclyn Hill and Becca were releasing the third installment of their cult classic highlighter, Champagne Pop. This third installment included a face palette, but also an eyeshadow palette. People were really excited. Some people received it in their PR, loved everything, and then some people received it 
and the quality was very different when it came to the eyeshadow palette. Base palette was great, but people had huge issues with the quality of the eyeshadow palette with most of the shades, if not all of the shades, being dry and patchy and really hard to work with. Jacqueline even made a statement on, I think it was Snapchat, specifying that the quality was just not it. Turns out Becca wasn't gonna be able to keep up with the supply and demand of the eyeshadow palette, so they outsourced some of the manufacturing of the eyeshadow palette to China, and China couldn't produce the same quality that Becca is known for. So the quality between the PR eyeshadow palettes and the customer received eyeshadow palettes was very different because of a different lab manufacturer. And people were extremely disappointed and felt incredibly duped when it came to the pre-orders of the eyeshadow palettes. So Becca released a statement, apologized and specified that the eyeshadow palette would no longer be sold and it is removed from the collection, it's removed from the collaboration and if people wanted they were able to get a full refund for the eyeshadow palette. People received their refunds, people were still really happy with the face palette that was a part of the collaboration and the internet internet forgave-ish and forgot-ish with this situation but at the same time unfortunately for Becca a lot of things happened since then which eventually led to a lot of customers not trusting them anymore and their downfall that led to the termination of Becca this year. In July of 2016 we have Tati Westbrook. This one's really odd but that's fine. Let's get into it. Tati announced that she was going to be doing a giveaway to celebrate her fifth anniversary on YouTube. Lucky us. And according to the very sparse information still left on the internet because a lot of things have been deleted to do with this one so we kind of have to trust Tati's word with a lot of this but according to Tati in her video to celebrate her fifth anniversary on YouTube she wanted to celebrate another channel a smaller channel and bring attention to their channel and just celebrate their artistry which I think is a really cute idea. She told people to make a video to really grab her attention to really show off their personality but around the time of this giveaway, Tati actually had a collaboration with Birchbox, which I believe was called the LOC collaboration. So in her announcement video for the giveaway, she specified that she would love to see people use her collaboration in their entry videos, but specified in the description that it wasn't a necessary requirement for the entry video. So you didn't have to use it to enter, but she would love to see it. And then from what I could tell, Tati had some issues, so the collaboration had to be postponed but she didn't announce any of this and I'm guessing the reason she didn't announce any of this is because she was under contract and it was just kind of that for a while people were wondering what happened with the giveaway but there was no real confirmation as to what was happening it just kind of went up in the air until thrift chick aka Cassie made a get ready with me video where she answered snapchat Q&A's and one of the questions asked in this Q&A was whatever happened to the Tati giveaway whatever happened to the competition where Tati was to fly a smaller creator to her so that they could collab on a video and Cassie offered up some personal opinions and some unnecessary speculations uh, that people took as her unnecessarily stirring the pot. Tati fans of course defended Tati but trashed Cassie in the process and then Cassie fans of course defended Cassie but trashed Tati in the process and in this whole entire dumpster fire of a situation there was a lot of me versus you for absolutely no reason in my personal opinion. I don't think that Cassie's speculation was necessary in her get ready with me video and I think the phrasing of cruel and rotten in description of Tati is a definite choice. But Tati's character is one that I'm not super trusting of, so it's really hard for me to give a benefit of the doubt to her response. Regardless, August 2nd, 2016, the winner was announced on Tati's channel where they filmed a one minute and 51 second video announcing the winner, and then they filmed a July favorites on, I hope I'm gonna be saying this correctly, Serene's channel. And on top of that, Serene was gonna be featuring on Style Code with Tati, and from my understanding, Style Code was a series thing that was available on Amazon, but it's either gone or not available in Australia, which happens quite a lot because apparently Australia is fucking Narnia. Either way, that's the situation. Next person we get to talk about is someone that I haven't talked about yet in these videos and that is Pink Sparkles. And I have never heard of this person before and the overall opinion I can find of Pink Sparkles, aka Sam, 
is not good. In 2016, Pink Sparkles announced that she was going to be releasing an eyeshadow palette, her first eyeshadow palette called the Cupcake Palette, I'm pretty sure, and she was going to be releasing it in collaboration with BM Cosmetics. From what I could find, Sam announced the palette, pushed it really hard on her channel, which is fine, don't get me wrong, but then September 25th, 2016, she uploaded the video called What's Happening With My Palette? All caps, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point, question mark, exclamation point, question mark. <laughs> and in this video, she actually announced that she was canceling the eyeshadow palette. The video itself is just an absolute hot mess express of a video with just a lot of contradicting word vomit. At one point we're talking about how there was such a high supply and demand issue that the manufacturers just couldn't keep up with how many palettes were needed, but at the same time people weren't happy with the palette and people weren't happy with how she was trying to sell the palette, so because of that there was too much pressure so she decided to cancel it because there was too many things wrong with the palette itself it was it was extremely hard to follow but she did specify in the video that anyone who had purchased the palettes in pre-order would be able to receive a full refund i can't find any information confirming or denying that this actually went through so i am going to assume that the refunds went through but by the sounds of some alleged information she didn't have to refund that many palettes because apparently the issue wasn't that they weren't able to keep up with the demand it was that there wasn't enough of a demand for the palettes to be made being viable. There wasn't enough ordered for them to make any of the palettes. She couldn't meet the minimum order, allegedly, so I guess that is why her statement on the situation lacked cohesive thought. This one isn't tea drama or scandal, this one is someone's pain, this is someone's trauma, but I did have a few comments specifying that I missed it, so here it is very, very briefly. In August 2016, Gigi Gorgeous was detained in Dubai for being transgender. She was not allowed to enter the country, but thankfully she was able to return home safely. Then we're jumping all the way to January 18th, 2017, where Trendmood announced on their Instagram that Prosecco Pop was going to become a permanent member of the Becca family in the cream, pressed powder and liquid formula. Until Jacqueline Hill commented on the post specifying that Becca did not tell her anything about this. Prosecco Pop is actually a Jacqueline Hill exclusive highlighter, so... Of course there was some people that sided with Becca in this situation, but most of the internet, majority of the internet, sided with Jacqueline Hill quite quickly, specifying that Becca was shady as shit and specified that Becca was a snake. Because of this situation, people speculated that the relationship goals of Becca and Jacqueline was no more and that the two had broken up. Especially considering that later on in 2017, Jacqueline and Morphe announced their first makeup collaboration being the Jaclyn Hill palette that was in insanely successful. But this moment in the history of the makeup industry did damage the reputation of Becca quite a lot and it lost a lot of loyal customers for them as well and it did definitely contribute to the downfall of Becca that would result in the termination of Becca in September of this year. Hello, future JJ here, editing JJ here. Number one, I think we just have to, I need to accept that documenting a complete history of the beauty community is just impossible, so that's that's number one. Number two, I missed out on a story. I thought that I put it in part one of this series, turns out I didn't, so one of the stories that I missed and then missed again isn't that fun? Don't we just love that for me? One of the stories that I missed twice was February 2017, Jeffree Star Cosmetics was launching the Androgyny palette, ooh, and Nikita Dragon was one of the models, ooh, and quite quickly everyone noticed the difference in Nikita's skin tone. Jeffree Star at this point in time had a lengthy history when it came to racism, so people did not hesitate to call him out for putting his model Nikita Dragon in blackface. Jeffree's statement on the situation is this, Nikita's statement on the situation is this, and both of them kind of give me the vibe of this. And unfortunately, I expect nothing less from these two creators, and I unfortunately expect nothing less from the photographer of this shoot either, considering in 2015, the same photographer produced this photo for Kylie Cosmetics. This was Kylie's statement on the situation. So weirdly, 
history is to repeat itself in the words of Dobby. That was an awful impersonation. I'm sorry. Then some comments on part one, two, and three of the series specified that I missed out on some of the dramas with Raw Christie Beauty. I don't know why I got rid of that mirror. In all honesty, I haven't actually watched much of Raw Christie Beauty's content except for the Jacqueline Hill lipsticks video that she did last year. Two years ago now. Oh, was that two years ago? I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> but through my research, I did find a few things on Christy. Uh, some of it being that there is this reputation that she has for being a lazy YouTuber, which uh, I don't know much of her content, so I can't really comment. But from what I've seen, I wouldn't really call her lazy. But also when Emma Chamberlain was getting quite popular, she had a reputation for being lazy. So I don't think that that's what those comments on my videos were specifying when they said that I missed out on some Royal Christie Beauty content. But not only did I find this reputation, but I also found comments of people specifying that Christie had changed over the years. So she used to be quite a breath of fresh air. She used to be quite relatable. Now she is like every other beauty creator out there, which neither of those I really see as drama. So I don't think that that is what the comments on my videos were specifying that I'd missed out on. So I think what it is, is the racism situation in 2013, 2015. And I hope that I haven't overlooked something, but I fear that I have just because the information is so vague. In March of 2017, Raw Christie Beauty issued an apology to what I think is her Twitter, specifying that she has educated herself and she was incredibly wrong in the past and that she was incredibly wrong for just assuming that she was in the right in the past. As I specified before, the information on this one is pretty scarce, but she was seemingly called out for these two photos specifically and in her original statement on the situation she she had a lot of choice phrasing uh one of those choice phrases was essentially that people who were calling her out could uh fuck off in all caps and she also said something along the lines of fuck this entitled 2015 whiny baby bullshit uh, where it's cool to get offended over everything. By the looks of it, the internet has forgiven-ish and forgotten-ish, which good for Christy, I guess. Uh, I can't tell if that's because she's seemingly learnt from the situation and she's at least attempted to make amends for her past behaviour because, as I said, I have watched very little of Raw Christie Beauty, uh, but I fear that one of the reasons why the internet has forgiven-ish and forgotten-ish is just because it wasn't too long until someone else in the beauty community had a racist downfall. Okay. I know what's next. Uh, I just looked at my notes. I know what's next. So in April of 2017, for those who don't remember, United Airlines overbooked one of their flights and they offered passengers free rebooking for a different flight if they volunteered to disembark the plane. No one volunteered because people wanted to catch the flight that they booked for, unsurprisingly. So workers for the airline company started selecting customers and escorting them off of the plane. One of the selected customers that was to be escorted off of the plane was Dr. David Dow. And instead of being escorted, he was dragged off of the plane at such force that he was given a concussion, was missing two teeth and broke his nose. The video of the situation is absolutely petrifying to watch. So like any, same content creator, Mikey, aka Glam and Gore, decided that she was going to do an SFX tutorial inspired by the situation. People were unsurprisingly not pleased with this video, finding it incredibly insensitive and distasteful, especially considering that the video was monetized. Glam and Gore eventually took the video down and made a statement on Twitter, and according to the screenshots that were put in a Daily Mail article covering the situation, the statement on Twitter could easily be summed up by saying, I'm sorry that you don't understand satire. I am sorry you don't understand my sense of humor. I am sorry that you missed the point. A condescending shit show from my perspective. I just need to take a cheeky minute just to explain that I am not okay, I'm not comfortable with how I have approached this specific story, how I've approached this specific apology because yes, I still stand by the fact that I think that there are some condescending undertones to it. I think that there is still a sorry you don't understand satire, sorry that you don't understand my sense of humour, sorry that you missed a point kind of aspect to the apology, but I am going at it way harder 
than I should be. I'm very confident that I know what's happened. It's happened to me a few times before, but typically I'm able to catch myself while I'm filming and this time I just failed to do so. Sometimes when I research videos like this and then film quite quickly afterwards and I don't give myself a chance to breathe, all of the stories just start to bleed together and I don't deliver it the way that I should be delivering it. So in the future I'm just going to in general be a lot more cautious but I will also be making sure to have a day's break between research day and film day. So I am sorry that I let some of these stories bleed together and I am sorry that I was a lot more harsh on this apology than I should have been. Especially when you consider Swoop's video on Mikey where she publicly ends their friendship. I have covered this video in part three of this series but one thing that Swoop highlights that Mikey has also done is not only did she do the United States Airlines inspired SFX tutorial but she also did a fake bruise tutorial and specified that it was inspired by Rihanna. Character consistency isn't always a good thing but by the looks of it the internet forgave ish and forgot ish. Ish. Also in April of 2017 the internet started to get answers to an age-old question which was what happened between Jeffree Star and Nikki tutorials. Because the two of them were hashtag goals, hashtag friendship goals, up until about 2015-2016 when the two of them stopped featuring on each other's channels. That was until the infamous Jeffree Star, Two-Face, Gerard Blandino Twitter feud where Jeffree Star announced to the whole entire world that Nikki tutorials got screwed over when it came to her power of makeup palette. During the Twitter fight, after the Twitter fight, around the time of the Twitter fight, here for the tea asked Jeffree Star for a statement. Jeffree gave the statement and essentially said that he, not essentially said, literally said, he and Nikki were no longer friends and that here for the tea could confirm that in their video. Then Sanders Kennedy posted a video in May of 2017 discussing the fallout between Nikki Tutorials and Jeffree Star and quoted a few of his sources that could neither confirm nor deny the information that they were giving Sanders. But allegedly on a Benefit Cosmetics brand trip to Necker Island, Nikki Tutorials and Jeffree star had an argument on a boat that ended their friendship. Sanders allegedly had a statement from Jeffree Star specifying that it wasn't some huge argument that ended their friendship, it was just a moment and they chose to go their separate ways. I'm very much paraphrasing Sanders' video though. And this isn't me trying to read anyone, this isn't me trying to shade anyone, this is just me stating a fact. Sanders' video was just Sanders and a camera. There was no evidence, there was no receipts. It was just Sanders and Sanders' word in their video. So I'm not saying that this did or didn't happen with Jeffree and Nikki. What I am saying is that there is insufficient evidence for me to completely trust what Sanders is saying in this video. And in all honesty, this is kind of it for the entire fallout of Jeffree Star and Nikki tutorials. Like this is, this is kind of everything. We know the when, we know the who, we know the how-ish, but we just don't really know the what and the why. But it also kind of doesn't matter to me. <laughs> in all honesty. But there are still two-ish little nuggets that I still want to discuss in this part of the video when it comes to Jeffree Star and Nikki tutorials. The first being when Tarte released their Shape Tape Foundation and the absolute shit show that followed. Because in Jeffree's review of Tarte's Shape Tape Foundation, he took time out to highlight that Nikki tutorials did not call out the lack of diversity when it came to the shade range. Saying that she may not want to use her bigger than his platform to have the conversation, but he will be using his smaller than hers platform platform to have the conversation and further specify that Nikki Tutorials has been on YouTube for eight years so she should know better. But the second little nugget for this situation is that in 2018 Nikki Tutorials posted a video where she did a makeup truth or dare combo and she specified when someone asked her what happened between Jeffree Star and her she specified that they weren't friends but also that she didn't have any kind of ill feelings towards Jeffrey. So with these two little nuggets, I do think Nikki overlooked some crucial points when it came to her Tarte Shape Tape review and she does not have plot armor in this situation. I do think that Jeffrey's phrasing of the call out was interesting, but that is very within character for Jeffrey. I don't think it necessarily came from a place of malice. That's just how Jeffrey is. As for Nikki, in my personal subjective and positively biased opinion, she is professional enough and knows Jeffrey enough to not hold a grudge against Jeffrey's call out. Either way, that is it for the Jeffrey Star Nikki tutorial saga. And researching this one, I'm not gonna lie, I was thinking to myself like, that's it. I thought this was good. They are, they were on a boat and they had a fight. That was... That's all the info we got. And, and by the sounds of it, people were losing their minds. I guess it's another one of those things where, in comparison to some of the things we have seen in 2019 and 2020, that moment 
is nothing in comparison. Uh, not that any of these things should really be quantifiable, but as time goes on and some really heavy shit happens, a fight on a boat is all you got? All right then. <laughs> also, also in April, we have Tati Westbrook, AKA Glam Life Guru, breaking up with Too Faced very publicly on her YouTube channel during a Hot or Not Nikki Tutorials Ofra collaboration review. Tati specifies in this video that she is no longer going to be featuring any Too Faced products on her YouTube channel because she doesn't agree with some of the company's ethics. And in her personal opinion, the company is quite Too Faced. She even uses the phrase, me and Too Faced are broken up. Cheeky little sidebar. This is neither confirmed nor denied. This is just all speculation. But because of some of the things that Tati has said later in the years about Jeffrey, people have speculated that one of the reasons that Tati broke up with Too Faced in general, but why Tati broke up with Too Faced so publicly, is because of Jeffrey Star. Not confirmed or denied, all speculation, cheeky little sidebar, let's keep going. It was actually later in the year, in November of 2017, where Tati did an anti-haul video and specified that one of the key reasons that she broke up with Too Faced is because she was at the Peach launch party and when she was there she had quite an awful interaction with the one, the only... Gerard Blandino. According to Tati in her video, she was invited to the party to support the brand. She did just that and was so disrespected by Gerard Blandino that it left such a sour taste in her mouth that she could no longer support the brand. Now, of course, this is just one side of the story. We aren't getting Gerard's side of the story. We aren't getting Too Faced's side of the story. But with everything that I have covered in this series of videos and everything that I still have to cover in this video when it comes to Gerard Blandino, Seems pretty in character. Then May 12th of 2017, Xsparkage or Leisha posted a review for the latest foundation applicator hitting the makeup scene. The Evie Blender being a silicon slash rubber makeup applicator foundation applicator, which seems like a curious concept. But unfortunately for Evie, the review was not a good one and Leisha couldn't even finish her foundation, couldn't even finish her base makeup because the sponge not really a sponge, the silicon applicator was just so trash. Here's the thing, you cannot please everyone. I know that everyone wants to, but it is just an impossibility. You cannot please everyone. And people are allowed to voice their negative opinions as much as they are allowed to voice their positive opinions. But Evie was not pleased by the review. Evie was not pleased with Leisha's constructive criticism and left this lovely comment on Leisha's video. Now, I don't know about you, but if my customer service is not condescending, I don't want a bar of it. I just, I want to feel patronized <laughs> when... <laughs> but Leisha being an absolute, absolute trooper, decided to give the Eevee Blender another go, decided to do another review and followed every single step that Eevee Blender gave. Leisha found that the Eevee Blender was still trash. <laughs> kind of like my eyeshadow right now. This is not the fantasy. Um, oofed, oofed, oofed. Da, 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 Um, okay, let's see if a cut crease can save this bad boy. So Evie, of course, made another comment this time on Instagram and even slid into the DMs of Leisha and both are very similar in tone and intention, right? They're almost identical. So Leisha, once again, being an absolute trooper, decided to post all of Evie's shady bullshit to Twitter for everyone to see, but also revealed this very lovely email that Evie sent to Leisha. I find it incredibly interesting that Evie sent this email to Leisha, but didn't send any kind of email to Nikki Tutorials or Laura Lee, who also weren't super pleased with the Evie blender, especially considering that Nikki Tutorials literally said in her video that it's like slapping my face with a dildo. It feels like you're slapping your face with a dildo. Eventually, after all of this backlash, Evie did wave their flag of surrender and did eventually post an apology to their socials. But according to a statement that x Barkage gave to The Revelist, the apology came a little bit too late. This one is in June of 2017 and it centers around Manny MUA and Laura Lee. Manny and Laura decided that they were gonna be going to the Morphe store. Woo! And they were gonna be buying all these products. 
products, woo! And all of these products were their absolute favorite, woo! And just had a really cute time, really fun time, and I absolutely love that for them. The way that this shopping trip was talked about, the way that this shopping trip was posted was supposed to be that Manny and Laura were going on a shopping trip and buying all of this stuff themselves. And then people looked at the Snapchats a little bit closer, doing the zoomies and everything like that, and found out that Manny and Laura actually spent zero dollars. Their receipt literally said zero dollars. Fans and the internet, of course, found this manipulative and shady as shit. When this story was dropping, when everyone was talking about this story, Laura decided that she was going to go on a huge Snapchat rant and essentially explained that her and Manny went to the Morphe store with the intent to buy everything. So they went there and they intended to buy everything, but then the owner who recognized them decided to comp everything so that they didn't end up paying for all of the stuff that they intended to buy themselves. Instead, they got everything given to them as gifts, which is fine. Fine, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, that information wasn't given out until they were called out. If Manny and Laura just said during the Snapchat shopping spree, like, oh, they comped our gifts. Granted, there still may have been some backlash from people that didn't believe them or trust them. Don't get me wrong, that possibly still could have happened. But I feel as though the situation would have been a lot lesser if they were just honest from the start. Like, as soon as plans changed, just tell people, like, oh, these got given to us as gifts because the store recognized us. Like, Am I losing my mind? <laughs> Either way, the internet once again forgave Ish and forgot Ish. That was until Drama Again Part 1 dropped and then all of Laura Lee's shady past got brought back up and thrown back in her face and all of Manny MUA's shady past got brought up and thrown back in his face. In Part 2 of this series, I highlighted a feud between Jackie Aina and Jeffree Star. Issue is there have been two major clashes between the two makeup creators on Twitter and I've only discussed the second and the last of the two clashes as of this moment. So here is the first clash that I could find. In a situation that is close to all but deleted at this point, Jackie Aina posted her infamous anti-haul where she specified that she will not be purchasing from Jeffree Star Cosmetics. Then in May, both were allegedly invited to a brand trip and both allegedly attended the brand trip. And during this brand trip, Jackie Aina allegedly tweeted that someone at the brand trip was making her incredibly uncomfortable. People have assumed and speculated that she was talking about Jeffree Star. Then June 16th, 2017, it all erupted on Twitter with Jackie Aina posting a screenshot of the fact that Jeffree Star had blocked her on Twitter. By the looks of it, here for the teen, Sanders Kennedy must have asked Jeffree Star for a statement on the situation and Jeffree Star commented back specifying that he blocked that irrelevant rat months ago before her anti-haul. Jackie Aina then responded and specified that Jeffree Star should just admit that he doesn't like black women who don't worship him and specified that it would be way easier than him inserting himself into fake beef. So for Jeffree at this point in time, there was quite a long history of racism. And on top of that now, we have the situation with Makeup by Shayla where he threatened to beat her. Makeup by Shayla being a woman of color. And now this very public call out when it comes to Jeffree Star's character and his history of racism, especially because Jackie Aina and a lot of other people on Twitter who are against Jeffree at this time specified that Jeffree only seems to call women of color uneducated and rats. And June 21st, 2017, Jeffree Star posted the video, Racism. When I find, when that, I felt like an idiot. I feel like an idiot because in my previous History of the Beauty Community Tease Drama Scandals videos, I talked about one of the Jeffree Star Jackie Aina feuds. Great, love that for me. I also talked about Jeffree's racism scandal where he posted the video racism, but I didn't like, I didn't put the timeline together. I didn't like one of the reasons why Jeffrey has made this racism video, I'm assuming because I don't see why else he would have made it. One of the reasons he made this racism video is because he was getting so called out on Twitter for racism. And I'm just sitting there being like, oh yeah, he just posted that of his own free will. Like, <laughs> It's like, it's like I had a puzzle made of three pieces. I had two of them and I was like, yes, good enough. <laughs> Just completely missed the crucial puzzle piece. The catalyst, if you will. Um, I'm not exactly going to make an ester and forget to put in the sulfuric acid now, am I? That was super niche. <laughs> Either way, from my perspective, it's quite obvious that Jeffree Star didn't learn from this situation, considering that he and Jackie Aina got into another Twitter feud later for essentially the same thing. But in this one... He called her a gorilla behind her back. 
So, um, we've moved on from rats. Not better. Okay, I had a vision. This is not the fantasy. I hate it. So I'm gonna put glitter, because glitter solves every issue. Uh, glitter, glitter will fix the mess that is my face. <laughs> Either way, July 25th, 2017, Anastasia Beverly Hills announced the latest edition of their Anastasia Beverly Hills family, and everyone was incredibly excited for that bad boy to be a part of their permanent collection. Oh, I think that made it worse. I'm of course talking about the Anastasia Beverly Hills subculture palette, and everyone was super excited until it showed up to their doors and everyone was incredibly disappointed because the quality was absolutely horrific. Many videos were made on this palette with a lot of people voicing their negative criticisms of this palette and a lot of people voicing confusion at the same time because this kind of quality for Anastasia Beverly Hills was considered to be an impossibility before this palette was launched. The resolution for this situation is definitely a weird one for me because according to Norvina the formulation was solid. She specified that the formulation was good, that it is exactly how it needed to be for the pigment payoff and that the pigment had even been drop tested, but also specified that Anastasia Beverly Hills had a fabulous returns policy and anyone that was having issues could easily go through customer service to get a refund, get a replacement palette. But at the same time made separate tweets thanking everyone for all of the love and support and specifying that she'd learned a lot from this situation. Ninth time that I'm trying to explain this thought process and this is going to be the one. I am probably being naive in this situation. I understand that, I acknowledge that, but I think why this situation feels so weird to me and so like is that is because we as a community are so used to at this point a product being launched and the launch is just awful whether it's the product that is actually awful or the launch itself that's awful regardless the launch is bad and then the business just handles the backlash so poorly that we as an audience become angry about the launch and the handling of the backlash to the point where the backlash almost seems worse than the launch itself, than the product itself that we were all initially angry about. So we feel that way and we're so used to that happening that when this kind of a situation happens, it feels so weird and different that it's uncomfortable, even though something like this should be the standard because from my perspective, and as I said, I'm probably naive with this one, from what I can see, yes, Norvina defended her product, but at the same time, it was just so easy for her to be like, oh, if you don't like the product, that's fine. Just return it, we'll give you a refund or a new product. It was, it was just that simple. Either way, that was subculture. I think I even actually have it. Do I have subculture? I think I do. Guess what bad boy I just found? I forgot that I had this. <laughs> I... She's, she's a bit worse for wear. Let's see, did I get one of the bad boys? Uh, um, I think one of the worst shades was Roxy. I did go a little bit hard with that one. That one, that one feels a little bit unfair. So we'll go for, we'll go for Dawn. Um, my favorite Buffy character. Um, um, oh, like I'm not going that light. Oh, okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> Look, it's pretty old. I hate it. So I'm going to try and add a different glitter over the top and hope that that fixes it. While I add a different glitter, let's get on to Kim Tai versus Ofra in September of 2017. September 6th of 2000. Oh. Okay, so let me just explain my plan because I'm I'm washing this off. Um, I'm legitimately washing this off. I can't. I I hate it so much. There, there is where I hit the microphone, and for some beautiful reason, the only thing that gets recorded in the microphone for another twenty five minutes is this. So much. Okay. Um, I'm legitimately washing this off. I can't. I, I hate it so much. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm legitimately okay, washing this off. I can't. I, so, I hate um, it so much. Okay. Um, I'm legitimately washing this off. I can't. <laughs> I, I hate it so much. Okay. Um, I'm when I said that I was having an absolute day that day, ooh, ah, she wasn't lying. <laughs> 
And my plan for this was to do neon. So I was going to do neon yellow to black. I know, sounds a bit crazy. Uh, I thought it could have worked, but... I don't know what's going on today. So I was going to do neon yellow to black and then have pink as kind of like a different, like a contrasting color. So I thought I could do that, make it look really bright, really bomb. And then underneath I could put like little toxic warning signs there because the beauty community is toxic. I don't actually think that, but I thought that that could be a little, a little fun look to do today, but this is just not working. Um, I don't know if it's the palette that I'm using or if it's the colors that I'm using or if I am just terrible at makeup. Uh, look, it could be a cute little trifecta for us. I don't really know. Either way, I think that I need to admit defeat and wash this off and try a different look. Gone. Made myself a tea, so I'm gonna sit here, have my tea, tell you all about Kim Tai and Ofra that happened in September of 2017, and then I'll get back to doing my makeup. I just sometimes what you have in mind doesn't work out, and that's okay. At least I tried, and I will do something better in the next. 10 minutes. Either way, Kim Tai and Ofra. September of 2017, Kim Tai, who was a beauty creator and also known as being Nikki Tutorial's best friend, announced that her and her relationship with Ofra is no more and her collaboration with them being Wonderlust, a moisturizer, is to be discontinued. Just for context, in November of 2016, Kim Tai and Ofra announced their first collaboration being the lightweight moisturizer Wonderlust and $2 for each unit sold was to be donated to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, which is super cute and I love that. But according to here for the tease video on this situation and all of her correspondence with Kim, Kim received quite a disrespectful message from one of the workers within Ofra. This message reduced her collaboration being Wanderlust to nothing more than charity and nothing more than just a stepping stone for Ofra to get to her best friend being Nikki Tutorials, which Nikki Tutorials has collaborated with. So Kim stopped supporting Ofra, which fair enough, and requested that Wanderlust be discontinued, which more than fair enough, but at the same time did what any good friend would do in that situation and still supported Nikki Tutorials and her soon to be launch with Ofra, but also gave Nikki Tutorials a heads up on what was happening via text. Kim was even lovely enough to give a bit of a heads up to a PR person at Ofra, and from my understanding, and I could be wrong, this is the PR person that reduced her collaboration to nothing more than a charity in the first place, and then this PR person done diddly fucked up. Because this PR person sent an incredibly harsh and incredibly shitty reply to Kim, thinking that they were sending it to Nikki and Kim, being taken very aback, decided to screenshot it, send it to Nikki and be like, what is this? And Nikki was like, I'm calling you right now to clear everything up. They had a very lengthy FaceTime chat because by the sounds of it, there is the possibility that either Kim thought that from the PR person's message that Nikki and the PR person were bitching about Kim behind her back or that the PR person was attempting to instigate bitching about Kim behind her back to Nikki. Either way, they had a very lengthy FaceTime call and by the looks of it, they were able to get themselves back on the same page, which good. Good. The PR person, of course, tried to apologize to Kim via text, but the damage was already done. And from my perspective, I think Kim handled the situation very professionally without emotion. And it was just very a matter of fact, which I think is a very good way to handle a situation like that. Keep it civil, keep it business, keep it professional. By the looks of it right now in 2021, the internet has quite a lot of mixed opinions when it comes to Kim. But back then the internet was very quick to side with Kim, felt awful for her and were not pleased with how Oprah handled the entire situation. Little nugget of information, this may have been because of contract, so keep that in mind, but a little nugget of information is that Nikki Tutorials did collaborate with Oprah again in 2018, so make of all that information what you will, but seemingly the internet forgave, forgot, and moved on. I don't know what happened, but I think I must have pissed on someone's grave or something because anything that could have gone wrong just went wrong the other day. So I had a cheeky little moment, decided, no, I'm not doing it anymore, and just stopped. And now we're back to it. So I think this is this is gonna go so much better. We've got a teeny bit of 2017 to get through, then all of the other years to get through, and it's gonna be awesome. So it's gonna, we're gonna have a great time. I'm gonna try and do my makeup again. This time it's gonna look so beautiful. All of you are gonna be like, oh my gosh, she's back. Um, we're gonna wear Callum, my cow hat, because Callum 
always makes me feel absolutely like, come on, I look adorable. Um, Callum always makes me feel so in control and so powerful. So we're going to wear Callum um, and we're going to try this different incense because maybe I bought the wrong incense. <laughs> this is apparently, it contains essential oils, lemon, orange, cedarwood and frankincense. Ooh, I don't know what all of those are supposed to smell like, um, but I'm sure they will smell like meditation and balance. Awesome. It's great. Let's get back to this video and let's get to October of 2017 where Tarte had a security breach. As I just specified in October of 2017, Tarte allegedly suffered a security hack to their database. In the security hack, people's names were leaked, people's phone numbers were leaked, people's email addresses were leaked, people's home addresses were leaked, people's purchase history was leaked as well. And on top of all of that, the last four digits of people's credit card numbers that were used to make purchases between 2008 and 2017 were also leaked. From my understanding, and I don't have a super keen understanding of software development, development companies, but from my understanding, it was a software development company called Chromatech that detected the leak and also was able to approximate that over 1.89 million numbers, like the last four, four numbers of people's credit cards were leaked in the hack. That's not good. <laughs> That's... That's a bit more than a cheeky little hack now, isn't it? The hack was allegedly carried out by hackers or hacker. I don't really know which one. Cruelty with a three instead of an E. <laughs> Cute. Uh, <laughs> and I can't find an official statement from Tarte. And I hope that I'm wrong in saying this. I hope that it exists and I just can't find it because if an approximate 1.89 million of your customers are having their details leaked, including the last four digits of their credit card leaked, and then the last story of 2017, we are almost there, is another Jeffree Star versus Kylie Jenner situation because apparently anytime Kylie launches a product, it gets Jeffree Star's knickers in a twist. Don't get me wrong, this one I do understand though because December 13th, 2017, Kylie Jenner launched her brush collection. Now I hear some of you thinking, how can you possibly screw up a brush collection, a brush launch that badly? How can, they're just brushes, right? How can you screw up brushes? Well, this 16 piece set and case was selling for $360 US. And when people received them, they were aggressively mediocre to be putting it very kindly. Before people even received it in their PR, they're sitting there being like, 16 brushes for $360? Are you actually losing your goddamn mind? Uh, but to make matters worse, Jeffree Star on December 14th posted his review video of it. And I have not made it very subtle, but I'm not the biggest fan of Jeffree Star, but I wouldn't say that this review video is particularly shitty of him to post. Because if you were charging $360 USD for 16 brushes and a case, they better be the best quality brushes I have ever experienced in my freaking life, especially considering that's in USD. I'm Australian, I pay in AUD, which means that I will be paying approximately 480-ish dollars with the conversion rate at the moment, not including shipping. Either way, on Twitter, Jeffrey was definitely a lot more blunt about the situation and essentially demanded an apology from Kylie and Kylie Cosmetics for the very overpriced brush set. And Kylie does what Kylie does best, and that was to say nothing. I once again couldn't find an official statement from Kylie or Kylie Cosmetics and I think at this point in time if I am correct and there isn't a statement it's just because once again you can't put your foot further in your mouth if you say nothing. But, and this is where it gets kind of funny to me, uh, <laughs> Kylie and Kylie Cosmetics or Kylie Cosmetics, but I think Kylie and Kylie Cosmetics, considering the brief little docu-series that she put on her YouTube channel, she obviously has quite a big say in how her company runs, which is good to see, I guess. Uh, they've removed Jeffrey from their PR list. <laughs> In retaliation, July 18th, 2018, Jeffree Star posted a video called Full Face of Brands That Hate Me. All caps. <laughs> and in this video, he calls Kylie Cosmetics lackluster, which... Uh, spicy take? Yeah. Accurate take? Wouldn't know. Haven't bought any. <laughs> Either way, that just seems to be that. Kylie and Jeffrey officially broke up. Uh, an iconic duo uh, that we are going to sorely miss. 
that is officially it for 2017. So we are finally on to 2018, starting in April with OCC disappearing or obsessive compulsive cosmetics disappearing off the face of the earth. If you're like me and you are unaware as to who OCC is, you may actually recognize their lip tars. This was their staple piece. This was their cult favorite piece. This is really what put them on the map. They were also a cruelty free vegan brand and were most known for experimenting with bold colors. And from my understanding and my research, they were actually an OG company that helped pave the way for other companies to get very bold with their color choices. But April 2nd, 2018, Reddit had noticed that OCC had just vanished. It was gone. The website was gone. The social media profiles were gone. Even the LinkedIn profile of co-founder and creative director David Klasfeld was gone. The whole entire company had vanished. And from my understanding, there was no statement. There was no goodbye message. It was just that they vanished. Uh, so what I am about to say next is completely speculation and just what I found in my research, but I thought that I would try and paint you some of the picture that the internet cooked up. It was speculation that a business relationship with Sephora was actually the final nail in the coffin for OCC. Because your girl is not a lawyer, but from my understanding, Sephora won. Kevin James Bennett was a longtime supporter of OCC and is a Emmy award winning makeup artist too. So that's kind of fun. But they specified in a goodbye post to OCC that has now been deleted on Instagram, the blood is on your hands, Sephora. So, um, you don't really say that <laughs> if it was a mutual breakup. And by the looks of it, the internet just kind of forgot. Of course, not the diehard fans of OCC, they always remembered. Cheeky little info nugget, David Klasfeld does have on his website that he has returned to the front lines of the makeup industry in the hopes of inspiring change and inspiring hope in a really challenging time, which dope, love that for him. And he started posting to his Instagram again in 2020, but the posts seem pretty sparse, but also they seem to be old photos that are just being reposted as well. Do with that information what you want, but that that's literally it for OCC. They were just here one day, gone the next, no official statement has really been made. Oh, I think I want to try and blend some blue into that. Ah, oh, I'm gonna regret this. I'm gonna regret this. It's fine. It's it's fine. It's, it's, I'm gonna regret this. <laughs> then in May of 2018, this is actually the first piece of drama when it comes to Shane Dawson in the beauty community. And that was because he accidentally got an Ulta employee fired. In Shane's video, $10,000 makeover before and after, Carol, a makeup artist at Ulta, gave Morgan, who is Rylan's sister, a makeover and Shane filmed the entire thing. And not only did Shane film the entire thing, but he also got permission from the store, which is why this is where it starts to get Get really messy. It was brought to Shane's attention that Carol was actually fired for the video, so Shane wasted no time tweeting to Alter saying, hey, Carol gave Morgan an amazing makeover. The video was really well received by a lot of people, by my huge audience. So it was really free promotion for Alta. So please reconsider Carol's termination because she shouldn't have to suffer for YouTube. Beauty influencers like James Charles, Jeffree Star, Manny MUA also chimed in specifying like, hey, Alta, please hire back Carol because if anything, you should be grateful that you have an employee like Carol who did such an amazing makeover like Carol. Please reconsider her termination. Alta then finally made an appearance to Twitter specifying that they love Carol as much as everyone else loves Carol and that Carol is very much still a part of the Ulta family and that they never fired her and she isn't fired and they are very excited for her to come to her shift tomorrow. Carol then came into the mix and started to discuss her side of the story. Her side of the story being that someone from HR approached her and specified that her appearance in Shane's video was representing Ulta and that someone from HR would be contacting her soon to discuss her employment at Ulta. So from Carol's perspective, it seemed as though she was getting fired, which I'm not surprised that that's the assumption that she made. And it was sad to her to see that Ulta was finally responding to her employment only because they were getting called out on social media. The only reason they seemed to care about Carol as an employee was because they were getting called out on social media. Unsurprisingly, Carol chose not to return to her job after Ulta's trash handling of the situation. So essentially, she got fired, Alta got called out, so then she wasn't fired but chose not to go back because she knew her worth. In all honesty, I haven't watched Shane's video on this one, so I haven't seen how he has edited Carol, but I don't think that this one is his fault. By the looks of it, he did try and do the right thing this time. He asked if he could film there. They said yes, so he filmed. I'm guessing that he asked Carol if he could film as well. And then when it all kind of went tits up, he tried to rectify the situation and rectify his part in the situation by getting Carol back her job. So 
I don't necessarily think this one is his. I think this one definitely falls on Alta for calling their employees family but treating them as expendable. I, I don't know about everyone else, but if I call someone my family, I'm not calling them family because I see them as expendable. And that goes for biological and assumed. Then in June of 2018, Jaclyn Hill and Morphe collaborated on their second makeup collaboration being the Vault collaboration, which, as I said in my initial video on this, super cute concept. All of the shades that we couldn't include in the original Jaclyn Hill pack palette in one collaboration. That's, look, I think that's a great marketing idea and I still stand by that. But in my first video on this, I only covered two bits of the puzzle. I only covered two pieces of this drama and I missed out on two. So here are the other two. The first one being the Agent Orange controversy. In one of the palettes of the Vault Collection being this palette, there is an orange shade that is called Agent and people thought that this was either a incredibly insensitive oversight or an incredibly insensitive pun on Agent Orange. The internet was very quick to voice their concerns, voice their opinions, and Jacqueline's statement was this in the situation. And in all honesty, I think this one is possibly just a huge messy oversight. Uh, just, I don't, yeah, that's, that's not really a joke that I think that a makeup company intends to make. If it is, that's a, that's a spicy choice. But in saying this, to develop this palette, there had to be multiple meetings and there had to be a collection of people in all of these meetings. Are you telling me that not one single person in all of these meetings sat there and saw that a shade was called Agent and that shade was orange? Not one single person sat there being like, oh, should we call the green one Agent instead? <laughs> It's someone's job to sit there and be like, hey, it just, is this good marketing? No. So therefore change it. Um, it's just, it's, it's not rocket science yet. Time and time again, I've covered it in these videos and someone has screwed up the not rocket science of naming makeup. People were seemingly okay to accept this situation as a oversight by Jacqueline and Morphe. And we moved on from the situation Possibly because it wasn't too long until there was another Jaclyn Hill Morphe scandal. So that's Something. Then the second piece of drama of the Vault Collection that I forgot to include in the first video is that Becca actually sued Morphe for the packaging of the Vault Collection. Now, once again, your girl, not a lawyer. So there's parts of this story that I'm not going to 100% understand. And because of that, my thought process around it may be somewhat simple. But July 27th, 2018, Becca sent Morphe a cease and desist letter over the packaging of the Jaclyn Hill Vault Collection because of a bunch of dots because this packaging, just too similar, was gonna confuse customers when it came to buying things. Dots. Those pesky dots. <laughs> From my understanding, which is not heaps, and that is both a mixture of lack of law knowledge, but also I just... Uh, it's just, it seems like a special level of petty, but apparently a circle with Jacqueline's name in it and then dots spanning out from it is just too confusing for customers and therefore Becca would take a financial hit. The packaging would financially hit Becca because it was too confusing to customers because customers just lacked the intelligence to be able to understand that this is a Becca product and this is a Morphe product. So Becca sued and Morphe counterclaimed specifying that dots aren't super original. <laughs> Who would have known? <laughs> and here's evidence of all these other companies that have used similar packaging before you. And I'm guessing in a situation that either someone backed down or this was settled out of court because I can't find any official this is what happened from the lawsuit and the counterclaim. Either way, Jaclyn Hill, circle, bunch of dots. Also in June of 2018, the Jackie Ina Petty page rivalry really hits a new level of what? 
that. Back March 19th of 2017, Petty Page made her first video on Jackie Ina. And in this video, Petty Page was critiquing Jackie's Get Ready With Me video, where Jackie was uh, talking about coupon codes, branded content, and affiliate codes. And very quickly after Petty Page posted this video, Jackie Ina actually copyright striked Petty Page's video. Now for context, the simplest way of explaining copyright is if you do not own the content, you cannot use the content unless you make it fair use by making it transformative. And one surefire way to make something transformative is to critique it or review it. So commentary channels if they use it correctly. A person can either copyright claim or copyright strike a video. A claim is typically automated but can be done manually. No mark is made against a channel and the claimant can choose to do what they want with the video, take it down or monetize it for themselves. A copyright strike has to be done manually. A permanent strike is added to the channel and the entire channel will be deleted if it gets three strikes. If someone is striked or claimed they can dispute the claim or strike and then someone from YouTube will go through the video and see if the claim or strike has any grounds to stand on. If they find that the claim or strike doesn't have any grounds to stand on then the video goes back up. It goes back up to being monetized and the person who claimed or strike the video in the first place cannot reclaim or re-strike. But here's the thing, false copyright strikes are illegal so you cannot be just striking everyone who critiques you that has a negative opinion of you and things you have said or done. Now the reason I'm giving you all of this context is so that you know that Jackie Ina had to go to effort when it came to striking Petty Page's channel. But not only did she go to effort to strike Petty Page's channel, afterwards she went to Twitter to have a fabulous Twitter rant. And in there she specified that she was in the right because the video got removed from YouTube. The reason the video got removed from YouTube straight away is because it was a copyright strike. And if YouTube doesn't take down the video, they are liable for some sort of legal thing that I don't know because I'm not a lawyer. The Twitter rant has since been deleted, but Petty Page has quite a lot of screenshots in her video responding to the situation, being Jackie Ina versus Petty Page, Jackie Ina copyright striked me. So <laughs> a very to the point title. But to be put very simply, Petty Page just disputed the copyright strike and someone at YouTube must have looked through the video being like, yeah, this copyright strike doesn't actually hold up. The video went back up and the strike was removed and Petty Page in the process essentially embarrassed Jackie Ina because Jackie obviously does not understand anything when it comes to fair use or copyright strikes. Apologies, copyright infringement is the word that I was mentally searching for. Then that was just that for quite a while until Jackie Ina posted a now deleted 30 minute video specifying that she had been hacked and she had had $1,500 stolen from her. Which, do not get me wrong, that does indeed suck. Being hacked sucks. Having money stolen from you sucks and I'm not trying to take any of that away from her. But Jackie has since deleted this video and because I can't see this video anymore, I am missing half of the story. But Jackie has since apologized for the situation to Petty Page. So I'm guessing that Petty Page is in the right of this situation because why would you delete the video that started this situation if you were in the right for posting it in the first place? I hope that that thought process makes sense. Either way, June 11th, 2018, Petty Page posts the video, I scammed Jackie Ina and stole $1,500 from her in all caps. In Petty Page's video, she discusses Jackie Ina's video, but also the huge consequences that she is now going to be facing because of Jackie Ina's video. Page specifies that in Jackie's video that has now been deleted, that Jackie didn't outrightly say that Petty Page is the person that scammed her and that Petty Page is the person that stole money from her. Jackie instead set up building blocks. She specifies that it was another YouTuber, another female YouTuber, another female drama YouTuber, another female drama YouTuber who's black which I've already had beef with Paige in the past and Paige fits all of this criteria so people are going to be making some intuitive leaps. So people went straight to Petty Page's social media and Petty Page specifies in her video that she could easily build a case against Jackie Ina for defamation of character because Jackie in this video has essentially accused Petty Page of identity theft and fraud, which are felonies. And not even just identity theft and fraud, but I think also like international identity theft and international fraud because Page is in the UK and Jackie Ina is in the USA. So it's like, becomes like a, like a bigger thing from what I understand, which I don't understand law, so uh, 
Yeah, it was just what Paige was saying in her video. Paige also explains that this doesn't just have the potential to ruin her life, but it also has the potential to ruin her family's life. And on top of that, she specifies that some people will sit there and say, well, Jackie Ina didn't say your name outrightly, but at the same time, she didn't have to, considering that so many people were just bombarding Paige with snake comments, but also other comments of hate, which I saw some of the comments and hot diggity damn. There are some evil fucking people out there. Petty Page even goes a step further in her video to mention and establish a timeline of the Google security breach and Yahoo security breach that happened around the time that Jackie Ina was actually hacked. So for Jackie, this is, this is a big fucking leap. Just, oh, I got hacked, must have been Petty Page. <laughs> um, that's a, big leap. Either way, for Jackie, as I already specified, she did delete the initial video that started this whole scamming, hacked, $1,500 missing situation. She did delete that video and she even posted an apology to her Instagram for starting this situation. And she emailed Petty Page an apology as well, according to Petty Page. And that was just that. The internet seemingly forgave Jackie. Petty Page was... In all honesty, Petty Page was so much better than I would have been in this situation. Page just wanted to clear her name. She just wanted to clear her name and be able to move on with her life, which mad respect to that because if someone if someone did that to me, oh, I I I wouldn't be out for blood, but I'd be close to it. So, uh Petty Page better person than I am, I think. <laughs> Uh, because I would have been a rage-filled absolute monster in this situation. In July of 2018, Beauty Blender decided that they were going to be launching their first foundation line. Ooh, very exciting. Now, let me remind everyone that in January of 2018, Tarte released their Shape Tape foundation line, which was very poorly received, and four months before that, Fenty launched. So, there was a standard someone didn't meet the standard and got roasted so you would assume that after that all companies that followed would meet the standard <laughs> nope we had another situation of 50 shades of fucking beige here's the announcement here's the line here's the shade range and like y'all had so much warning and y'all had so much time to fix it before you announced but you didn't uh <laughs> Just at that point, people are purposefully putting their heads in the sand, right? Either way, the situation unfolded like this. Trend Mood posted a photo to their Instagram. People saw the shade range. People started roasting Beauty Blender. Then Beauty Blender came out and said, hey, there must be a really weird filter on this photo because this does not show off the true extent and inclusivity of our shade range. Then people received it in their PR. It wasn't a filter. Now I understand better than anyone that I am a greedy, greedy bitch for some contrast, but if my pale ass can fit essentially the entire upper arm of the swatches, then you're done fucked up. Regardless, people have seemingly forgivenish and forgottenish when it comes to Beauty Blender, and Beauty Blender has increased their shade range and product range now, which is good and shows that they were always able to. Then in the middle-ish of 2018, I couldn't find a specific month, but in the middle-ish of 2018, a history of homophobic, racist, slut shamey ableist tweets were found of Kim Ties from back in 2013. I don't feel at all comfortable putting screenshots of the tweets in this video because I don't want those phrases to be a part of my content in any way, even if it is just screenshots of someone else's tweets. But let's just say that Kim Tai had her own Murphy's Law. If there was a slur that existed that she could put in a tweet, she did. And in some cases, more than once. Kim did address these tweets in August of 2018 in a series of Instagram story posts and none of these apologies or statements are for me to deny or accept, but nothing says sincere to me like a series of Instagram story posts. And because of this, I can't actually gauge audience response. So this is just my assumption, my personal opinion, my subjective opinion. But if you don't exactly think that an apology is gonna go well, I would post it somewhere where people cannot comment, like, or dislike. But from what I can see of other people's posts covering the situation and just the reputation that Kim has on the internet, she doesn't really seem to be a favorite of the internet. I have all of this makeup that I haven't used yet that is just kind of sitting there collecting dust in a shame box of mine. <laughs> like things that don't have a specific place just end up in their own little box or little drawer or something like that. So I think I'm gonna sort through this to try and find something that I've never 
never used before that might be able to match what's going on in my face right now. Um, right? That, that should be cute, right? But now we get to August 3rd where there was a huge Twitter beef between two beauty creators being Alyssa Ashley and Miss Tiffany Ma. Alyssa Ashley is seemingly the original creator of the mystery wheel chooses my makeup trend that everyone has now done at this point. I've even done a dartboard chooses my makeup video. It's it's just a very common video style at this point. Miss Tiffany Ma then did a Mystery Wheel Chooses My Makeup video and she didn't give Alyssa Ashley any credit. Alyssa Ashley then went to Twitter and specified that Tiffany should give her credit. Tiffany said, hey, Alyssa is a great makeup artist, but I genuinely haven't seen her videos before. Alyssa then said Tiffany is full of shit because at one point they actually had the same manager and Tiffany said, even though we had the same manager, doesn't mean that I've seen your videos before. And then there was just this really weird back and forth over giving credit. With this one, I can definitely see both sides, but in the grand scheme of things it is a mystery wheel then august 11th 2018 because august was apparently a very busy month for the makeup community nikki tutorials posted a video to her youtube channel called world's weirdest sponge it's fuzzy in all caps in this video nikki explains that she was scrolling through instagram and saw this very weird sponge by juno and co she decided to buy it it showed up she thought you know what why not do a first impressions review and she did a very in-depth thorough first impressions review which love that we love an info queen a girl boss too hard a girl boss too hard oh no it wasn't really until here for the tea posted a video in september where this issue really came to light according to here for the tea's video on the situation nikki tutorials didn't actually disclose any information when it came to brand affiliations promo codes or business relationships with juno and co and then according to here for the tea's video one of nikki's fans actually put in nikki as a discount code as a joke and it worked. So by the looks of it, Nikki's fan loved her review so much that they were like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna buy this sponge. So they went to buy the sponge and they were like, oh, lol, I might just use the code that Nikki uses with all of her other brand affiliations just as a joke, just to see. And it worked. So by the looks of it, Nikki had a brand affiliation with Juno and Co and just didn't disclose it. The fan provided evidence of the promo code working to Here for the Tea and Here for the Tea put it in their video, but not only did they provide evidence of this promo code working when it shouldn't have because no brand affiliation was disclosed, but also they showed that the link that Nikki had in her description of the video was actually a traceable link where Nikki would earn money just off of clicks. And to add more fuel to this speculation, Nikki posted to her Snapchat four days later specifying that Juno and Co had actually seen her review and wanted to offer her fans a discount code. So according to all of the evidence that Here for the Tea posted in their video, Nikki Tutorials did not disclose a brand relationship and attempted to double dip on profits, being the clickable link, but also an affiliate code. From my understanding of the situation, Nikki Tutorials never made an official statement on this situation specifically, but a few years later, she did do a video where she played a fake Nikki Tutorials game. In this video, she does actually take a second to specify that when she was younger she was very greedy when it came to business relationships and affiliate codes and that she has learned from the situation she is attempting to make amends and she is employing a new system so that she can be a lot more transparent for her fans for her supporters so make of that information what you will but that is Nikki Tutorials and Juno and Co's controversy. Then in November of 2018 James Charles and Morphe collaborated on their first makeup palette being the Artistry palette. I have covered one of the controversies to do with this palette but I forgot about this one so here it is. And it's definitely the biggest story to do with this palette so good job past me. But one fan was very vocal in voicing their disappointment to the internet when a shade called Skip stained their eyelids but also caused them to get hives. People were incredibly quick to defend James, including James, and were accusing this person of misusing the palette and doing this for clout and just really harshly trying to educate them. There was a lot of heated back and forth between James and this angry customer on Twitter and then seemingly that was just that. About a month later, James did readdress the situation in a video collaboration that he did with Jeffree Star. They did a chit chat get ready with me on James's channel. I will be fully transparent in this, but after all of the drama that has happened surrounding James Charles and Jeffree Star, I am no longer a fan of either of them and my bias is definitely negative towards both of them. But in this video where they were discussing bits and pieces of drama, they definitely gave me this vibe personally of being incredibly entitled and condescending. So a cheeky little makeup lesson for all who don't know, when it comes to a lot of palettes, specifically the vegan palettes is the ones that I find that this happens the most with. When it comes to the red base shades, so 
are reds, oranges, pinks, purples, warm tone browns as well. When it comes to all of those shades, they are technically classified as pressed pigments, not eyeshadows, and their packaging will specify that they are not supposed to be used around the immediate eye area because they are not FDA approved to be used around the immediate eye area like eyeshadows are. It doesn't have to be vegan and it doesn't have to be specifically red based shades. Those are just the ones that I see this happen most commonly with. So if you are someone who is prone to allergies or just have really, really sensitive skin, I would recommend if you are having concerns with specific colors, specific pigments to do a, uh, thank God I wrote it in my notes, a patch test, do a patch test. If I ever have concerns when it comes to specific things that I put on myself, I will just put a teeny little amount of it on my skin, put a band-aid over the top, leave it for 24 hours, take it off. If I have a little welt looking thing, I'm allergic. If I don't have the welt looking thing, I'm not allergic. Last time I did do this test, turns out I was allergic to the band-aids and it was a bad day for everyone. <laughs> Cause of course, the one time I get new band-aids and do a different patch test, I'm allergic to the glue on the band-aids because why not? I don't do a patch test for every product that I use, but anytime I start to have concerns about a specific product, I definitely will. But yeah, it's just, I find it unnecessary in that video that James was super entitled and was super condescending because I don't assume that that little nugget of info is something that is commonly known. Once again, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. I don't assume that that little nugget of information is something that is commonly known because the only times I've heard or seen it explained explicitly is if someone puts that information in a video explicitly or you read the fine print on the back of the packaging. So the condescending tone in James's video, I think is super unnecessary because why are you assuming that people know that the pinks shouldn't be used on the immediate I or it just, it just, it seems so unnecessary. It's just one of those situations where in that video, he had to put in more effort to be a dick than to just not say anything. So, that's why I find it unnecessary. That video still would have flowed exactly the same if he wasn't really condescending. Either way, next, one of my favorite stories that I get to discuss in this video. I'm very excited because in this series of videos, there has been quite a handful of stories where it's just like, why? But did you, oh, another one of those situations where you literally had to put in effort to be a dick. Uh, so in December of 2018, Gerard Blandino posted a photo of him and his partner with a cake in front of them that said, rich lives matter. Legitimately, this story is one of those stories where I can't help but sit here and be like, <laughs> not because it's funny, but just because I'm so exasperated. Exasperated? Exasperated. Exasperated by the story that I just wheeze laugh out of just, I don't know what the fuck this is uh i researched this story and no shit like actually just tapped out for the night <laughs> i just oh that's enough internet for one day because gerard blandino posted the photo of the rich lives matter happy birthday cake um why is that what you put on your birthday most people go for happy birthday don't mess with a classic it's a classic for a reason either way posted the photo people were like whoa buddy why are you doing that? It's a bit insensitive. It's a bit racist. And then Gerard Blandino posted this apology. And do you notice in this apology that the apology is for posting the photo, not for the cake in the first place? Like the photo wasn't the issue, babes. The photo wouldn't have caused an issue if you just wrote the classic Happy birthday. This story makes me lose my mind because it, this isn't stupidity. This isn't dumb. This isn't them being like, oh, we didn't understand. They understood and they got caught. That's, that's my personal opinion. That's, that's why I sit here like, <clears throat> because this wasn't like, a, oh, we didn't understand the phrase and what it meant. You knew and then you posted it and people weren't happy and you're like, oh no, sorry for the photo. Like, you know, and you're fine with it. You're, you're fine with what the cakes, you're apologizing because you just want people to buy your products again, not because you actually believe in what you're saying. Um, you believed in what was on the cake. It's just whatever. People, people are shit. <laughs> this is, this isn't, mm. <laughs> 
this story broke me, I think. I think it's this story. This There's one in every video, and I think it's this one for me. This one in this video for me is just... Why not just put a happy birthday on the cake? Um, that was the first unnecessary step. Um, just... Just why put why not why not just put happy birthday on the cake or just don't put writing you don't even need to put writing just put a just put a candle light it happy birthday <laughs> like that's just why do we have to spice it up like that <laughs> either way that's it for 2018 now time for 2019 because fun fact I missed a lot in 2019 as well including in January 2019 where Manny MUA reviewed Morphe's latest release of foundations and concealers. The majority of Manny's first impressions video was that the concealers and foundations were dry, patchy, made his pores look huge, smelt like paint, just an overall trash review from Manny which is fine if you don't like a product don't like a product you're not being forced to like it and please express your honest opinions. The issue is. At the end of the video he specified that overall he was pretty happy with the concealers and foundation and spent a minute talking about how he was an affiliate of Morphe and how he had an affiliate code. So a bit of a hard review to trust because how can you be overall happy with a concealer or foundation if it's dry, patchy, smells like paint, makes your pores look huge. I <laughs> Like, I'm a greedy bitch for contrast, but that's not, that's, I don't mean that contrast. People, of course, got rubbed the wrong way when it came to Manny's first impressions of the foundations and concealers and weren't quite invoicing their opinions of this video to the point where Jeffree Star actually gave a positive review of these foundations and concealers and people were accusing Jeffree Star of posting a fake review as well. This one, my opinion's pretty simple. If you like a product, you like a product. If you don't like a product, you don't like a product. Don't be a fraud. And if you're going to be a fraud, at least be smart about it. At least be subtle about it. Then March 16th, 2019, Norvina posted this tweet to Twitter. And I have tried my hardest to find the original tweet, but as time goes on and more tears, drama, scandals, and controversies happen, some of them not to quantify being bigger or more volatile than the next, a lot of the evidence starts to dilute of previous tears, drama, scandals, and controversies. So the best I can do for this situation is to insert screenshots of screenshots of Sebastian Williams's video. But this tweet is a photo of the Anastasia Beverly Hills PR welcome package for the people who just made it to hashtag the list. Norvina announced on her Twitter that Anastasia Beverly Hills was looking to add a thousand new artists to their PR package list. And then we had the Twitter makeup artist Battle Royale. Some people of course played the game with a lot of admirable sports personship like conduct, which I am of course an expert in. Touchdown, am I right? And some people use techniques like trashing other creators to build themselves up, guilt tripping, pity parties, and other forms of manipulation. So really two sides of, of very different coins, which those are definitely the people that I wanna give my business and platform to. The creators that upon first meeting make me feel like shit. Either way, essentially Norvina went, well, here she is, left the internet for a weekend, came back being like, oh my gosh, I didn't think this was gonna be that big, which, you did. <laughs> this was an incredible business move and a very good marketing tool and I ain't judging as long as you just own it. James Charles of course chimed in at one point specifying that people's nasty attitudes make them undeserving of being on the list no matter how talented they are which that's Hi, pot, meat, kettle. Either way, as the story typically goes, the internet once again kind of forgot about the situation and that was that. Anastasia Beverly Hills still does list searches to this day every now and then and good on them, some free promo. And then we get to April of 2019 and I completely glossed over this situation. I don't understand how because I remember when this dropped and I was like, are you joking? But that's fine, so... I covered the entirety of the Bi Sisters situation in part two of the series and I completely forgot this little nugget of controversy. So here it is now. April 24th, 2019, James Charles posts the video making my own Starbucks pinkity drinkity video. And in this video, he announced that he was going on a sisters tour. Woohoo! Now James going on tour, I think is a fabulous idea and it's really exciting for him and really exciting for his fans. And James's demographic at this point in time was primarily 16 and younger and probably still is. But these were the second confirmed 
ticket prices. James, of course, got torn to shreds online for the ticket prices being so outrageous and just for, in general, being greedy. These are the updated prices. So originally a meet and greet was $200. So I guess they got better. But also, even though a lot of the internet was very much like, you wanna, you wanna charge how much for a ticket? Uh, not too many people must have been outraged because the tour sold out. Either way, my bias is definitely against James Charles in this situation, um, all situations really, but do I think that he was intentionally being greedy when it came to the tour's ticket sales? I... I wouldn't be surprised. It seems very within James Charles's character to be intentionally greedy with these ticket sales. But I also think that someone or some ones on James's team must just absolutely hate him because how did no one know that this was going to blow up in his face? How did no one know? How did no one sit there and be like, $500? Are we sure? I just, I feel like we're going to piss a lot of people off. And then people start to think and be like, oh yeah, $500 may be a little bit much. Maybe we shouldn't do that so that people... So that he doesn't get into another scandal. He's been in enough. So I think that people in James's team are either A, not qualified enough to do their job or B, hate him. <laughs> I just like it was someone's job to it was someone's job and they just didn't why they didn't I don't know but it doesn't really matter because in May of 2019 by sisters dropped which is also commonly known as drama again part two which if you don't know what that is I'm very surprised, but I covered it in part two of the series and I really don't want to recap it in this video because we don't want to be here for four fucking hours. But essentially, after everything was done, Tati posts her video, James po posts his awful apology, Tati posts her second video, James posts his video that was the Uno reverse, and then Jeffree Star posts his video. After all of that happened, James was like, hey, I'm too exhausted by what just happened. We're canceling the tour. Lots of people were angry, lots of people were upset, but at the time, before all of the information came out this year, at the time, people were annoyed, but as understanding as they could be about the situation. But also anyone who purchased a ticket to the sisters tour was issued a full refund. Then also in May of 2019, we once again have another story of first launch blues. This first launch being the first launch of Trixie Cosmetics. And in all honesty, this situation could have been so avoidable. So Trixie Mattel, a lovely fifth alternate when it came to season seven of RuPaul's Drag Race and the winner of season three All Stars of RuPaul's Drag Race, decided to launch her own cosmetics company May 24th, 2019. From my understanding, it was launched at DragCon, which is super fitting and super cute for Trixie. Where it started to get not cute is that fans who ordered in May actually hadn't received their products by the beginning of July which is not good. By the looks of it, it was one specific product being the Stacey lipstick that was causing so many issues and delays. But the issue was that there was such a lack of communication that fans and customers were getting frustrated, which is fair. It's a part of the gig. When you sell things, communicate with people when the things you are selling and they've purchased are going to be arriving. It ju it's, it's just how it works. And to add more fuel to the fire, someone at Trixie Cosmetics posted this to their Twitter. At this point, I can only assume that someone was actively trying to fuck over Trixie Cosmetics because you have angry customers, frustrated customers that have had such a lack of communication whose products still haven't shown up and you are specifying that the money that they have spent on products that haven't shown up has already been spent on a new collaboration. Mm -hmm. Haven't even finished the first launch successfully and planning the next launch. Like, come on, I haven't even studied business. And I know that that was a dumb move. It just baffles me that some people are just so stupid because it'd be like me going to a restaurant to have dinner and I am getting so angry and frustrated because my mains have taken two and a half hours to show up. And then the chef comes over to me being like, hey, I know you're waiting on your mains, but it's okay, we've already started your desserts. Like, I don't give a fuck about my dessert. Give me my schnitzel. <laughs> I think I'm gonna light more incense. Either way. <laughs> 
Where's the Zen one? Either way, people have seemingly forgiven ish and forgotten ish when it comes to Trixie Cosmetics because I went to the website, had a look, had a look at all future launches, and everything seems to be in order and everything looks really cute as well. So, love that. We love a queen who learns from her mistakes. Then also in May of 2019, because apparently May was also a busy month for tease, drama, scandals and controversies, uh, Anastasia Beverly Hills and Alyssa Edwards, the lovely fifth alternate from season five of RuPaul's Drag Race and the lovely fourth alternate from season two All-Stars of RuPaul's Drag Race had a collaboration together. Lucky for Anastasia Beverly Hills and Alyssa Edwards, the issue wasn't seemingly the collaboration, but the people who were receiving the collaboration in their PR were actually selling it. And by the looks of it, there is the genuine possibility that some of these people who were reselling their PR had just gotten on the PR list from the Battle Royale that I had just covered as well. So one, pretty disrespectful, and two, actually illegal in some states of the USA. So already not the smartest move, but on top of that, Norvina did not hesitate to remove these people from the PR list. So you also screwed up a pretty major brand relationship to sell off a palette. I do understand that you never know what another person is going through and maybe selling off this PR was the only way for them to put food on the table. I do understand that, but Regardless, it did have a pretty ungrateful vibe to it online. Especially when you consider, and I assume this from the wording of some of Norvina's tweets on this situation, that some people were kicked off of the list to create the battle royale, a thousand people are being added to the list situation. So some people were kicked off to make room for this person who was then reselling the palette. So yeah, just adding more fuel to the fire. Either way, the person cannot be 100% identified. They were seemingly removed from the list and that was just that. This next one, I'm not gonna lie, is absolutely completely fucking bonkers and is also kind of unhinged and I'm gonna be fully transparent in the fact that I don't understand entirely what is going on. <laughs> And it's also kind of still ongoing today. Also on top of that, we're gonna be talking about Lily Jean, but Lily Jean and her mother have absolutely no concept, no understanding of what fair use means and what fair use is. And seemingly anyone who gives them negative criticism is just automatically copyright claimed or copyright striked. So I will be trying to keep the visuals in this part of the video pretty light because in my personal opinion, I do not trust these people and my bias is going to be incredibly negative towards anyone that tells another person to get COVID. This is Lily Jean, a self-confessed beauty creator, actress, and model. That, according to this Reddit post back in 2019, she had 1.1 million followers on Instagram, which cute, dope, love that for Lily. And because of this was getting heaps of sponsorships and also business collaboration opportunities, which once again, dope, love that for Lily. Until Reddit, the internet, and r slash beauty guru chatter to be specific did what the internet does and that is started looking for answers. The internet started finding a lot of inconsistencies when it came to Lily's social media profile, specifically her Instagram, and they started to look very similar to profiles that would typically buy their followers. She also had terrible engagement rates when it came to her socials and add on top of that, some of these collaborations were either just straight up fake or were very misrepresented. By the looks of it, some of her PR, some of her codes, some of the events she attended was actually real. The issue was, was that her work was not necessarily the same as someone with 1.1 million followers. She's stealing opportunities and money from other creators that didn't allegedly buy their followers, which, I completely forgot about this part of Lily. Okay, so, not only is there all of the like alleged buying of followers and the business opportunities that were fake and all of that that I just mentioned, but also there was a few Instagram accounts, friend accounts that would interact with Lily on her social, specifically her Instagram, and she, they would she would interact with them back and. In this series of videos, I've covered some awful trash behavior. This one is awful and trash, don't get me wrong, but also just fucking weird. These friend accounts were allegedly run by Lily Jean and her mother, and they had very intricate backstories as well. The, not to quantify, but what is commonly seen as the worst, 
out of the friend accounts was the account called Shaniqua. From the screenshots that still exist, because the account has been deleted now from my understanding, from the screenshots that do exist, yes, Shaniqua used the N-word quite frequently. An account that was allegedly being run by Lily Jean and her mother. Uh, but reading through some of the captions and interactions with Shaniqua, it definitely feels like a 2009 Shane Dawson character study. From what I could find, as early as October of 2019, Commentary Channel started covering Lily Jean and her rise to fame and just the absolute odd uh, backstory that is Lily Jean's social media. And since then, Lily Jean and her mother have made a consistent unhinged history of copyright striking channels unfairly, having Twitter accounts deleted and suspended entirely because they said something against Lily Jean, doxing people and just maliciously weaponizing her mental health and her fan base to just trash and destroy anyone who ever talked negatively about Lily Jean. And wildly, even though this story starts all the way back in 2019, it is still ongoing till this very day. And I think one real sad thing about this whole entire situation with Lily Jean is that it is very obvious that Lily Jean is a young, beautiful woman with a lot of passion and a good foundation for the things that she has passion in. If she put the same amount of energy that she has been putting into all of this bullshit over the last few years that I have only just very briefly laid out in front of you into being the person that she preaches that she is, then she would be that person. Instead, she is just wasting her potential and wasting her energy into this narrative. And I just wish that that kind of chaos stopped there at Lily Jean. But oh no, now we get to talk about Glitter Forever 17. This situation is just an absolute brain melt for me. Of researching this one, I was like, I, uh, I sure. Why, why not? But you, you can. So I, that's why. Awesome. This is a bit of a slow burn, so a few things actually happened before August 30th of 2019, so just for a cheeky bit of context. Glitter Forever 17, aka Breland, had been posting to YouTube for quite some time, but didn't reach any real heights of fame until the DIY boom, where anyone and everyone was posting DIY videos, and the channels that did really, really well were posting EOS lip balm videos and slime videos, which that is what was Breland's specialty. And because of this, Breland did really well for quite some time until her videos started to get really weird and really uncomfortable because they were seemingly using childlike things but had a bit of an adult quirk to it, which is fine. It's just sometimes... Uh, sometimes. For example, she made an EOS lip balm out of a pregnant Barbie when most of her demographic was very young children, which it was really uncomfortable. Uh, but that's it. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> it was. I watched the video. It was uh, definitely. Mm. But as her content began to change, she actually ended her 10 year relationship and quite quickly started dating someone else and quite quickly actually married them, which not my business. If that's what makes you happy, that's what makes you happy. But then more videos were filmed and posted to a YouTube channel that would also just straight up unhinged that involved the partner. One of them being that Breland drugged her partner and then started doing stuff with them, which I understand it was a joke, but especially when your demographic is young children, you can't always assume that they're going to be in on the joke. And also it's just really weird content to market towards children, whatever. It's, it just is. Um, and then another video where her and her partner announced that she was pregnant um, and then spent a lot of the video discussing how they were going to kill the child. Uh, I'm pretty sure they posted an apology video later, but that wasn't very well received because it was a very insensitive weird video and all of these videos, even though I understand they were dark humor, these videos were filmed, edited, posted as a joke. But unfortunately, jokes have to be funny. Alyssa Edwards at the RuPaul Roast was funnier than those jokes. 
Either way, at the same time, Breelin was also streaming a lot on the app YouNow, which great, love that for her, but she was also acting a little bit weird on the YouNow live streams as well, including drinking excessively and just picking fights with watchers, telling people to fuck off and other beautiful phrases. To a lot of the audience's perspective, they were watching one of their favorite creators spiral into a person that was unrecognizable, and a lot of people actually feared for her mental health. Then Breelin posted a video to a YouTube channel called What Happened to Glitter Forever 17, where she explained why she hasn't posted to a YouTube channel for a while and essentially goes round and round in circles explaining that her life just sucks. She's getting older, she doesn't know who she is and she even has to sell her house because she is out of money. Essentially a huge pity party explaining that everything that she had ever worked for in her life when it came to social media was slipping through her fingers and it sucked. And you know what? It does suck. It is a shitty, shitty feeling. But there's a way to express this constructively, and re-watching the video that is still up on her channel, it feels like a toddler is trying to manipulate me into buying them candy. Her videos that followed had the same going round in circles, pity party, manipulative vibe to it, in my personal opinion, but I will say that her foreclosure house tour video that I watched definitely had that same vibe, but it also had some very interesting insights into what happens when someone becomes an overnight success what happens when someone just suddenly comes into a lot of money and how it can all go wrong. It definitely wasn't the point of the video, I don't think, but it was very interesting to watch and very interesting to see that kind of perspective because I guess we see a lot of when things go right and not necessarily when things go wrong. And I guess there is an important lesson in that video. It just sucks that it was wrapped up in this kind of package. And then we get to the 30th of August 2019 and this is where my brain just kind of melted after all of the research. 30th of August 2019 Breland posted this video to her YouTube channel which essentially explains what happened in all of those You Now videos where she was acting a bit weird that got people concerned about her mental health in the first place and in this video to be put very very simply she explains that she was pulling a Trisha Paytas. No shit she uses the phrase I was pulling a Trisha Patus to bring in views. An online troll for money, for views, for clout, for fame. I was pulling a Trisha Paytas. Um, yeah, just 2019 was a, a real moment for beauty community. Um, good job everyone. Next story. Now, I don't watch Jackie Aina, but by the looks of it, in September of 2019, she posted a few pics with her, her partner, and her private jet, which it's her money, she can do whatever she likes. However, the issue is, is that apparently Jackie has been quite vocal on the internet over the years about how we all need to do our part in improving the world we live in, and a private jet is a surefire way to fuck up the environment. So some people thought this was in really poor taste, called out the hypocrisy, and Jackie was incredibly dismissive about everything. And this seemingly is just this. I think I've missed something. I've probably missed something, but this just seems to be the entire private jet situation. Then we get to November 1st of 2019, where Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson launched the Conspiracy Collaboration. Woo! I briefly covered it in my part two of this series, and I mentioned that it was a really high note for the beauty community, which I still stand by, but there was a piece of drama that I missed that I didn't cover in that video, so here she is. Actually, there's technically two bits of drama that I forgot to cover. One of them I would say is slightly a positive for Jeffrey and Shane but it didn't come without its frustrations and that is just the fact that the palette sale did break Shopify. I say it's positive just because Jeffrey Star and Shane Dawson get to have bragging rights from breaking Shopify because too many people were coming to their website to buy their product that they literally broke the back door to all of these sales platforms. Like that's that's no easy task. So the only real negative and only issue that I found when it came to this palette, this collaboration, was that people were finding itty bitty hairs in their eyeshadow. And let me just say that 2019 was an absolute shit show for finding little hairs in makeup. What? Why was that a consistent motif of 2019? Either way, Jeffree Star and Jeffree Star Cosmetics launched a full investigation and found, to be put very, very simply, the material used to press the shadows, press the pigments, little fibers were breaking off of that material and getting embedded in the shadows and the pigments. And then Jeffree and Jeffree Star Cosmetics were willing to send out brand new replacement makeup for the faulty makeup and issue a full refund to the customers that were affected by the faulty makeup. And people forgave and forgot and people were happy with their product until the 
downfall of Jeffree Star and Shane Dawson in 2020, but I covered that entire thing in part three of my history of the beauty community tease drama scandals. That is all the stories that I missed in 2019, and by the looks of it, I only missed three for 2020, which I'm pretty freaking proud of myself for that one, and by the looks of it, the first one that I missed was in August. So I did pretty well for the first half of the year as well, but I missed August 22nd, 2019, where AOC or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez featured on Vogue's YouTube channel. Essentially, it was a cute get ready with me with a cheeky red lip, and AOC even like casually slipped in there some political issues like the pink tax, which I thought was... I think it was I think it was a really good video. I really enjoyed watching it. One person who seemingly didn't enjoy the video like a lot of other people did was Jen Love. Jen decided that she was going to do a video where she followed along with AOC's Vogue video, which I think in concept is a really cool video, but there was a few comments in her video that sounded really friendly, but no matter how friendly they sounded, were an absolute choice. The internet even started to question why Jen, a makeup professional, Jen, a makeup enthusiast, was struggling so hard with such a simple tutorial, and people started to question if Jen was purposefully fucking up this makeup look. Jen compared AOC to JK Rowling with the phrasing of people who menstruate, and people didn't take kindly to this comparison. JK Rowling around this time had been quite vocal about her transphobia and AOC at this point had been doing quite a lot of work for the trans community including jumping into an H Bomber Guy live stream that was raising money for the charity Mermaids. So a lot of people thought that this comparison was incredibly ignorant, incredibly weighted and incredibly suspicious. There was also quite a few sly comments that Jen tried to slip into her video allegedly and I say allegedly because Jen has since deleted the video so I couldn't see for myself but apparently the vibe that Jen was giving off was quite shady but was trying to pass it off as friendly which <laughs> and on top of that, when Jen was receiving a lot of backlash and a lot of negative criticism, she was being incredibly ignorant, arrogant, and dismissive towards the negative critique. Eventually, Jen took down her video with this post, and seemingly that was just that. AOC seemingly wasn't bothered by this video, and I say this because I couldn't find a statement from AOC on this situation, but also she has bigger things to deal with than Jen's video. Now, I have had so much help from all of you guys, and I want to say thank you so much when it comes to actually documenting the history history of the beauty community because in every single one of my videos I ask you guys have I missed anything and I will get some comments and I'm so appreciative and on community posts I've been like hey doing research is there anything you can think of and you'll have commented and I'm so appreciative. I did however get a few comments specifying that I missed some things about Candy Johnson and I'll be honest I don't know if I have found what those comments were specifying. I do understand that she promoted the Lisa Frank Glamadols collaboration, which update, the GoFundMe is gone. It's been deleted. It's been, it's not deleted. It's been suspended. GoFundMe has gotten rid of it. Um, I'll put a little screenshot there. I do understand that she promoted this collaboration, but I don't think she promoted it knowing it was a scam. I don't, I don't think Candy is the kind of person to sit there and be like, it's a scam. I'm a promoted. I think that she promoted what she thought was a good bet at the time and then it turned sour so I don't think that's what y'all were talking about. That's rude. Candy also did a makeup collaboration with the company Too Faced after the Power of Makeup palette dropped and after the drama around the Power of Makeup palette dropped. So seemingly people weren't too impressed with the business relationship that she had with Too Faced. So there is all of that. And when it comes to the Too Faced thing, it is more just a matter of opinion that has been expressed, but there wasn't a concrete moment where it was expressed, where she did receive backlash. So other than that, I think it's the situation with Beauty Blender that happened. If not, I have missed it and I am so sorry. Owner and founder of Sahi Cosmetics, Shelly Sahi, had an ad pop up on her Instagram, which was the Beauty Blender Opalescence Primer, and she noticed that it was almost identical, if not identical, to her Mystic Primer that came out years beforehand. Shelly was incredibly upset, which fair enough, and took to TikTok to express her heartbreak over a bigger company stealing from her smaller brand. She also expressed in this video that thousands of people actually received this primer and used this primer thanks to a FabFitFun collection that she did, but also Candy Johnson had previously used and promoted her company. Candy and Shelly were both DMing each other, as seen in screenshots in Shelly's video, clarifying the entire situation on her YouTube channel. And you could see that both parties were essentially trying to express their point of view in a at times constructive and not constructive way from both parties in my personal perspective, but there's, there's kind of nothing. But in Candy Johnson's video statement, 
on the situation. She specifies that Shelley didn't actually want to clear the air. Which... Okay. And also in that video that can be seen in Rich Lux's video on the situation, Candy was crying about how Shelly was accusing her of taking her Mystic Primer to Beauty Blender so that they could steal the formula and claim it as their own with the Opal Essence Primer. It was a really confusing situation that I was trying to like just piece together because there was a lot of she said, she said, and a lot of things that were lining up, but also people were misinterpreting and reinterpreting for their own narrative. It was fucking weird and so destructive like this situation could have been really simple and it just wasn't but Candy's interpretation was really confusing to me because seemingly from Shelly's first video on the situation all she really said was that Candy Johnson has heard of us and that was just so that when people were messaging her or commenting to her saying oh you're a small company how do you think that Beauty Blender's even heard of you she was able to say well Candy Johnson's heard of us and she's worked with Beauty Blender so there's a possibility that Beauty Blender has indeed heard of us and on top of all of this Beauty Blender was actually threatening a defamation suit against Shelly even though though Shelly has IP rights to the Mystic Primer and possibly even the Opalescence Primer and she didn't actually say anything like super defaming in her videos. I think she did. I'm not a lawyer and I've said that a lot in this video but from my perspective as a non-lawyer perspective I think she teetered the the fine line just enough that she didn't specifically say anything defaming. She just said that her product is so similar that it's heartbreaking to see or something along those lines. Either way with this situation specifically I think there is a lot of suckiness. I think that there is a lot of things that suck for all parties involved but I also have a healthy dose of how the fuck did we even get here? For a conversation to be constructive, both parties have to be willing to and able to put in the effort. The effort to express themselves clearly but also the effort to listen. I think with this situation specifically, there was a lot of poor phrasing from both parties but also poor listening from both parties which ended up with these weird allegations getting tossed everywhere and people's fans defending people against allegations that never actually existed in the first place. It seems to be water under the bridge at this point and I just hope that each party has recovered from this situation and learnt from this situation. I'm not sure what lesson there is to be learnt but I'm sure that there is one. If this isn't the last story, if I've missed something else, I do not care. I do not care. I do not care. I missed it and that's just how it's gonna be. I missed it. It doesn't exist in my series. I don't care. I'm so sorry. Uh, it just, I'm done. I'm done. After to this story I am done and I am so happy and I am so terrified to edit this. Either way, September of 2020 we have Jacqueline Hill versus Jackie Ina. Awesome! <laughs> also I'm trying to be a little bit quiet at the moment because it's almost midnight that I'm filming and I have housemates and I don't want to wake any of them up because I'm pretty sure some of them are trying to sleep. Either way, September of 2020 Jacqueline Hill posts a call out to Twitter specifying something along the lines of oh y'all aren't praising me now that I'm unproblematic but you'll profit off of me when I am problematic and people unsurprisingly had issue with this tweet because from where I'm sitting an unproblematic person doesn't have to specify that they are unproblematic because they are just that unproblematic and is not calling out this vibe just stirring unnecessary drama for no other reason except you're a seven-year-old wanting a lollipop after a vaccination. Either way, Jacqueline Hill backtracked quite quickly and specified that it wasn't the negative comments or the drama channels that she was trying to call out, it was actually other influences that weren't supporting her, which just made everything a whole lot worse. Because Jackie Ina jumped in and highlighted the fact that she had supported Jacqueline Hill for years and received nothing in return. So what's the go with that? Jacqueline then tweeted an apology specifying that she shouldn't have been a child about the situation, she shouldn't have been so emotional about the situation, and specified that she shouldn't have jumped to Twitter to express her hurt emotions, her hurt feelings. So what I think happened is that this is just some subtweeting gone wrong. I think that someone specific must have hurt Jacqueline, and I think Jacqueline was trying to specifically subtweet them but it was so poorly worded and vague that it blew up in her face which definitely sucks to a certain extent but just because someone hurts your feelings doesn't mean that you can hurt other people's it may not have been her intention but it was definitely the effect and I think with all of that said and done I don't have any opinions left on this story I think that she very badly worded a subtweet and this is just the result 
Bowie. My rabbit's running around. I I lost my train of thought. I don't have any thoughts left on this story. It is the last story. Therefore, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I started this series of videos specifying that I didn't think that the beauty community was a toxic place. I think it was a good place with toxic people in it. And I started this series as a way to semi-prove it. But I think I just gave everyone evidence for the opposing team. <laughs> this series of videos is not how you win a debate. <laughs> but even after this series, and I stand by the fact that if I've missed something, I'm sorry, I'm not going back. This is it. I'm done skis. I am done skis. Uh, even if I've missed something, um, I still stand by the fact that I think that it is a good place, but there is just some toxic people in it, or there is just some toxic moments in it. Usually at the end of my videos, I think this happened in my last two videos as well, usually at the end of my videos I feel some sort of a sense of accomplishment or satisfaction, or I get to the end of it and I feel like a... I feel like... I feel something. Right now, I know that I've got a tub of ice cream. Yep, lactose intolerant has a tub of ice cream. I prepare for this bad boy. I have a tub of ice cream in the freezer just waiting for me. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's Ben and Jerry's. I, I, it's a pint. It's, I spent money. <laughs> and I'm going to enjoy it. That is my reward. I just, I kind of feel nothing. Um, I kind of feel nothing. Getting this video filmed was an absolute shit show. I don't understand what happened that first day, but just anything that could go wrong did go wrong. Today's filming day, though, today's filming went quite a lot better. Substantially, substantially better. So that's good, too. I just don't even know how to wrap up this video. I guess, please let me know down in the comments if no, I'm going to regret saying this. Please let me know down in the comments if in all four parts of this series I've missed anything. I hope that none of you find anything. If you do, please let me know anyway. Please let me know in the comments below all of your thoughts and opinions for everything that I've discussed in this video. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Maybe y'all can apply some logic to the Rich Lives Matter cake. I would... I don't think it exists, but maybe someone has some out there. Please also let me know what you want me to talk about next because I know what I want me to talk about next, but I won't know what you want me to talk about unless you tell me. And I am currently working on some butterfly effect videos because I've had lots of requests for more of those and I'm really excited for that. And yes, I am going to be doing, as I've specified in this video, already a recap of the entire year because if I've done this series, it would be stupid to miss out on 2021 and while you're commenting all of that please also let me know what you think of my face take two this is usually I'm way more hyped uh this is I don't know what it reminds me of I think there's a game that my brother used to play called portal I feel as though I look like portal but if portal was makeup and made you feel like a boss ass bitch I could still take on the universe like this try me I am a god um, I really like this look. It looks a little bit muddy in places, but it's kind of a vibe that I'm really enjoying. Um, maybe I've got to play around with this kind of vibe again. Once again, draping. Love a bit of draping. It's a good technique. Yellow highlight blush kind of situation. Who knew that that would be a vibe on my face and that I would be feeling incredibly powerful because of that. Fight me right now. You wouldn't dare. Actually, you could probably beat me right now. I'm pretty fucking exhausted <laughs> and with all of that said thank you so much for watching this video especially if you made it to here because people love when i say this i don't know why but people love when i tell you how much footage i have and at the moment i want to cry because i have 11 hours and 20 minutes that's i'm feeling so much pain right now <laughs> Oh, that's disgusting. Um, great. Hate that for me. Love that for how this video is gonna... Oh, God. So I have absolutely no idea how long this video is actually gonna end up. So thank you so much for watching 
any part of this video, doesn't matter if it's five seconds, half an hour, an hour, this video is probably going to be around the hour and 50 minute mark, uh, but thank you so much for watching this video, especially if you made it to here because that is so much time to donate to me and watching my content and I'm just so grateful and I just hope that you are having a fantastic day, fantastic week, fantastic month, fantastic year and I hope that you are doing as fantastic as always. Bye everyone.